Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Swan Lounge. I hope you're as excited as I am for this episode. I'm a little uh, Thanksgiving hungover, but we're going to talk about that. Before I bring in our guests, though, we have a very special couple of announcements from the Swan. Hold on, folks. Here comes the Swan. Ladies and gentlemen, Bitcoiners, pre-coiners, no-coiners, and shit-coiners, welcome to Swan Lounge, a weekly show in which you get to hang out with the Swan team and some of our friends from the amazing world of Bitcoin. We do this show every Friday, and it's called Swan Lounge because we are lounging. Unlike our more serious show, Swan Signal Live, Swan Lounge is about kicking it with our friends, talking about the week's biggest events in Bitcoin, and just having fun. Before we dive in, we're doing something that I think is very special. We're giving away Jan Pritzker's book, Inventing Bitcoin, for free in an effort to spread Bitcoin knowledge. You can go to swanbitcoin.com slash free book to claim your copy. We have it in three different ebook formats and MP3, read by our friend Guy Swan, no relation, over at Bitcoin Audible. All we ask is that you pay it forward by sharing the book with at least three friends and family, preferably more. And to all the Swan Force members out there, we've set up a way for you to give away the book to help you recruit new Bitcoiners. Look in your referral dashboard, and you'll find a link you can use to send people to your Swan Force landing page so they can get the free book offer and you can get the referral credit. And if you're not signed up for Swan Force yet, go to swanbitcoin.com slash enlist to get started. It's a great deal. You'll earn 25% of Swan's fees on their purchases for three years. And your referral gets $10 of free Bitcoin if they become a SWAN member and start saving $50 of Bitcoin a week or more. Also, make sure to watch to the end of the episode because we have a special segment called SWAN Force Fridays, where we'll put our guests on the clock and give them 60 seconds to give us their best Bitcoin pitch. Finally, we all know that automatic recurring buys are the best and safest way to accumulate Bitcoin. But every now and again, you might just want to buy right now which is why Swan is launching Buy Now very soon. Sign up at swanbitcoin.com slash buy now to be one of the first Swan members to smash that Buy Now button. Before I let Brecky take over with our guests, one last thing. Please, please, pretty please, smash that like button and hit subscribe. Doing so helps us beat that no good, dirty YouTube algorithm, which in turn will help us spread the good word about Bitcoin. And now, without any further ado, it's time for Swan Lounge. Hey, everybody. Oh, wait, everyone's muted. Wave, wave. Okay, now you can talk. Hey. Hey. Oh, Max, you, you had on your, there are your sunglasses. I wore my, my, my fake Max Kaiser sunglasses. Uh, I, I see you, brother. I see you. <laughs> I see you through the shaded view. <laughs> how's, uh, how's everybody doing? How is uh, Thanksgiving? Who's hungover? Raise your hand. Turkey hungover. Turkey hungover. <laughs> Max made an amazing keto pumpkin pie. Oh, I think we're too loud. No. Yeah, I made uh, keto pumpkin pie, keto ice cream, keto pumpkin mousse. Yep, yep, it was all good. Was the turkey keto? Turkey keto, turkey keto. No, we put carbs on the turkey. Oh, we did have uh, stuffing. So we, we did our once a year digression into bread and carbs. And that's why I got the hangover. <laughs> it's uh it's definitely a thing I, I i forewent keto for for thanksgiving and i had more bread than i probably had in the last couple of months in one day and not feeling so hot because of it yeah or exactly it could have been the fact that I, I, my stove was slightly left on and gas was filling up my house all night and i only realized in the morning so i'm a little loopy <laughs> That's exciting. That. check your stoves people dangerous very dangerous <laughs> So uh, what was the uh, what was the winning dish? Is my question. Everybody's got a favorite. Before we get into the uh, you know the real the meat of the week, the uh, the real Bitcoin stuff. What uh, my favorite was a, a pumpkin bread pudding, which was out of this world. A little caramel mm. sauce, and uh, it was it was pretty pretty spectacular. Reed, tell uh, tell us uh, one. Where are you, or where were you for Thanksgiving? Why you went there, and uh, and what was uh, what was the favorite dish? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I came down to Vegas uh, to get out of the cold Montana winter. Um, and actually, as a result, didn't really have access to a good kitchen. 
And the only restaurant open last night was Chinatown. And so I went to a dumpling place, great dumpling place. First time I'll ever have dumpling or first time I've ever had dumplings for Thanksgiving. Probably the last, but uh, that was the highlight. <laughs> That's not too bad. You know, Thanksgiving's a, you know, it's a feeling. It's, it's not just the food. So Stephen, you're, uh, you're out in a, in a desert climb as well. Where, uh, what was your Thanksgiving like? I am happy to report Thanksgiving was great. Uh, so I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. My family's around here too. So we got together and they are also aboard the, the keto train as I have been for a while now. So we had a big keto Thanksgiving. I would say the highlight for me was my mom made a killer uh, keto pumpkin pie. So almond flour crust, it's good stuff. Let's dig in it. I love it. Mr. Clipston. Um, let's see, favorite dish. Had some Michter's meat and then uh, moved on to like an aged Elijah Craig. Uh, actually ruined that with a little bit of Pepsi, but I was getting a little toasted and I was going to have to drive home in a little bit. So uh, <laughs> those, those are probably my two favorite dishes. Um, and then there was, you know, a beer can turkey that somebody made that was pretty solid. The pecan pie was amazing. And then uh, wifey Mrs. Swan made a couple of, uh, of dishes with her spice inflected angle on Thanksgiving that were very popular and gone very soon. So no leftovers for me, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Max and Stacy, I can't remember. Were we talking about it before the show? You, give us Keto all pumpkin a pie. Keto pumpkin Keto. pie. There we more, go. more, more. <laughs> My favorite dish was the dip, the Bitcoin dip. I just ah. it up. I, I did. I did indulge in some of that as well. <laughs> it's a tasty dip. I'm not gonna lie. You know, uh, might even be tastier down at 15k, but uh, we'll get there. We'll get, or we won't get there. We'll see. We, we don't know. So um, the pullback. The pullback was actually the next thing I wanted to talk about. We might have some viewers at home who are a little scared. It's their first dip, perchance. They've uh, just bit the bullet. They're stacking with Swan. And they see the price go down, and 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 they, they might want to sell. And um, you know what do we say to those people? Well, I saw a tweet from Phil Geiger today, friend of the Swan, had him on the show recently, and he said after this massive sell-off, Bitcoin is only up 123 percent this year. That was the um, the emoji he used, one of the uh, that one, just for so you know. So. I'd love if uh, you know we could give some advice to to some some Bitcoin noobs about dips in general and why they're tasty and not necessarily a bad thing, especially one like this that's kind of healthy, where you see all these altcoins plummeting and Bitcoin not plummeting too much. Corey, what do you think about? <laughs> well, I just, so for people that didn't haven't lived through these things in a in a big bull run. Bitcoin historically has a lot of pretty major pullbacks. In fact, in the path from, uh, you know, 180 bucks up to 19,683 or whatever we got to in December of 2017, there were eight pullbacks of at least 30%. So, you know, I, I got in, you know, I don't know, May of 2017 and I was like buying at three and it went up to five and then it was like two, eight and then it was like seven and then it was like four, nine and then it was like 10 and then it was seven again. And then finally you kind of like run up and, and go nuts. So, you know, to put that in context, I guess we hit 19.5 last week or whatever. And, you know, 30% down from there is 13.6. You know, and these weren't all exactly 30% pullback. So historically, you know, 40 is very within reason. It just doesn't really matter. Your best bet is just to be like, you know, getting comfortable with how much of your fiat inflow or the fiat you have laying around or the stocks that you don't want is kind of laying around and put some into Bitcoin as much as you have conviction around and, and keep on adding to it as, as you have cash available. 100%. Um so I forgot to introduce our guests, by the way, although I think everyone knows who they are. Uh, real quick, we've got Mr. Stephen Cole, amazing Bitcoiner, a Swan advisor, and investor, a keto carnivore maximalist, among other things. We've got Reed, our amazing support guru, of course, Mr. Corey Clipston, founder, co-founder, founder, co-founder, co started Swan. And uh, we've got the, how do, I, how do I describe them? The dream team, the the couple that everyone wishes they were part of, Max and Stacy. Um, Let's turn this is Bitcoin. 
Mr. and Mrs. Bitcoin. <laughs> Wait, Brecky, did you say that everyone wishes they were a part of that couple? <laughs> I know, I didn't yeah, go there. Really, we're really, going to work on the phrasing a little bit. Into, man? Do I have to get naked? What's happening? <laughs> Get wild in the lounge. Max, you need to change your your Twitter handle to Stacy's my wife again for a few oh, yeah. months. Stacy's my wife. Again. Back off. Uh, anyway, yes, we're beyond my uh, my hungover talking about uh, Max and Stacy. All right, but Max and Stacy, you two have been on this Bitcoin roller coaster for longer than anybody. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on a massive pullback dip. That we uh, that we just experienced. The whole point of dollar cost averaging is you want pullbacks. That's the point of it. You go to Swan, you get dollar cost averaging, and you pray for the pullback because you want to get maximum maximum sats for your dollar cost averaging. The number one, number two, you know the way to look at this is is this. You know, you just look at it like if you had a stock that was nineteen and a half and it traded down to seventeen and a half, and then very quickly it was back around eighteen. Would you give it a second thought? No. You know, on a percentage basis, that's that's what we're that's what we're talking about. You know, we went at nine and a half, nineteen and a half thousand, seventeen and a half thousand. Now it's you know, back close to eighteen thousand. It's it's not really significant. Uh, number one, number two, the fundamentals are getting stronger every single day. So look, I tell people don't even look at the price because that's not the most important thing about Bitcoin. It's the hash rate. The hash rate. You know, is that over 130, 140 quintillion calculations per second? It's never been down. It's never had a bear market. You know, the hash rate's always going up. And that's the fundamental. That's the key to it. Uh, are blocks stopping being propagated every 10 minutes? No. Uh, it is the, um, the, the level of institutional interest growing exponentially? Yes. Right. So the fundamentals are keep going up. And also the third point is that with Bitcoin, the trade-off we make for unconfiscatable, uncensorable money is we're willing to accept some volatility. You know, the, the converse of this would be, oh, I own a money market fund and it, it's not volatile. It stayed, uh, it stayed the same for 15 mm -hmm. years. Oh, my purchasing power has gone down by 30% because of inflation, but I didn't have any volatility. Right. So, you know, Bitcoin reflects the reality that the fiat money is collapsing mm -hmm. and we want to be avoiding the fiat money world by owning Bitcoin. So the volatility is is really not Bitcoin being up, going up and down. It's the fiat money world having volatility. Bitcoin is still propagating every 10 minutes. It's like gold. No matter what the price of gold is, an ounce of gold still equals an ounce of gold. And gold tells you what the what fiat money is doing more than fiat money tells you what gold is doing. Once you get into a Bitcoin mindset, it tells you what the fiat money world is doing. And during the last 10 years, the fiat money, the U.S. dollar has experienced a hyperinflationary collapse against Bitcoin. And that trend is incredibly powerful. So any any particular if you can get sats 10 or 15 percent off on any given day, on a Black Friday sale like we're having right now, that's what that's why you're doing dollar cost averaging. That's why you signed up to Swan because you don't want to emotionally be involved in this. You just want to stack sats. And if it's if it's down one day, that's great for for you. You know, Warren Buffett buys stocks when they're cheap. He doesn't buy them, you know, necessarily when they're high. You got you got to buy value at the best price possible. The fundamentals are there. The value is there. If you're buying value at a cheaper price. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Of course, it's a good thing. You want to buy this fundamental value at a, the best price possible. I also, you did mention that we have been in for quite a long time and Kaiser Report has been covering it since, uh, you know, it was b below a dollar. And I was, look while assembling to the moon, our 10-part documentary series about Bitcoin the first 10 years, I came across a comment, I think it was in like September or October of 20 uh, of 2011 and so bitcoin had you know it was like at two dollars on our very first episode and then it went up to 30 and then it crashed down to one and somebody in the comments am i allowed to swear on the show Fuck yeah. i think it's a requirement actually yeah you're required to he, it's friday yeah, somebody in the comments says fuck you max kaiser i put my life savings into this shit coin they used shit coin back then 
<laughs> because of you. I piled everything in at 30 and now it's one dollar. And uh, they were really angry. And I was like, oh my God, I bet you got that guy's prancing around on Twitter acting like an OG. Like, I am so cool and have been, you know, so relaxed, been in at 30. <laughs> But I could tell you, the man had a mental breakdown at uh, when yeah, it fell back. If $2. you believe in the fundamentals, then you want to you want to buy as cheap as possible. If, if the price is down and it, it, and you're saying, "Oh my God," and it challenges your conviction, then you yeah. need to go back to to Bitcoin school and understand why your why your conviction is not where it should be. Mm -hmm. You should have maximum conviction about Bitcoin at this point. I mean, pff, back in 2011, it was hard not to have conviction. But in 2020, going into 2021, I, I you know, there's there, every single, sh every single, uh, you know, rebuttal that any professor, any economist, any money manager, any government, anyone has ever said anything about it. We've already, we've dealt with it. We've dealt with it in a hundred different ways. No one's come up with any new criticism of Bitcoin in five years. And, and the, uh, the, the fundamental argument, the Michael Saylors, the Robert Breedloves, these folks have come in. It, Safety in a moose. I mean, it's like uh, the, being in the symposium in the forum of ancient Rome or something. These are the best minds of our generation. Mm -hmm. and, you know, who's gonna Who's gonna push us aside? You know, Nouriel Roubini, a freaking crackhead, sex orgy <laughs> maniac. <laughs> can't. Who's gonna get fired from NYU for insubordination? Oh, I mean, who cares about this guy, Paul Krugman, who thinks fiat money is only good if you kill people with it? Nouriel's so, like the. Right, uh, right. The Joseph Stiglitz, who who's has already five lobotomies. I mean, why would you listen to those people? It makes no sense. Peter Schiff, who was born to lose. <laughs> so I had uh, two, two interesting conversations this weekend uh, that kind of are right on the money with what you're talking about here. You know, I was speaking to my grandfather about Bitcoin, and he brought it up because look, Bitcoin's in the news again. Wow! And so he's talking, asking me questions, and Every time he brings up a piece of FUD, I had an answer. And he says, oh, well, you, you've answered everything, huh? And I'm like, yeah, Grandpa, we actually do have an answer to everything. <laughs> and uh, it, that didn't really help with him, though. So I'm still working on him. And then another one of my friends, he, he texts me and he says, you're going to be so proud. I finally have a whole coin. I went in. I, and I was. I was very proud. And he then said, and now I pray. And I say, no, now you don't pray. Now you read this free copy of Inventing Bitcoin from Jan Pritzker that we're giving away. And you start watching Orange Pill Podcast and you start reading Robert Breedlove and you build the conviction that you need to have. Um, and I'm finally getting through to him. So that's that's a good thing. Um, but that's the thing is, like, like you said, we have this pantheon of minds now that it, all you have to do is, is start reading and your conviction will come. Um, so it, it's not very difficult. Um, yeah, just to follow up on something you also said, okay, Bitcoin was down, what, 10, 13%. The shit coins were down 30, 40%. Now, this is the problem with shit coins. And this is why people who say they trade shit coins profitably are always lying. Because they the volatility is 10, 20x. And you just, it's impossible to have a conviction about any of these shit coins because there's no underlying fundamental value. They're, they're, it's like going into Vegas and saying, I've got really a high level of conviction that the number seven on the roulette wheel is going to hit. And you put your money down and it's not a hit. And you're like, fuck me, I'm a moron. And you walk out of the casino a loser. Now, uh, with Bitcoin, how would you like to own the roulette wheel? And everybody else is playing fiat money casino games. And now every time they make a mistake, you get a payday. And they're making so many mistakes. They're printing trillions and trillions of worthless fiat money debt coupons. And that means we're going to get fucking stinking rich. And it's just a matter of, you know, I'm willing to accept the volatility in exchange for unconfiscatable, uncensorable, absolutely scarce, hardest money ever. That some that's I mean, that's I'm willing to accept that, you know, that that's that's what we got. That's the trade off. A hundred percent. You know, we hey, uh, Breck, yeah. just just noting your um, this conversation that you were having with a relative. Mm -hmm was basically exactly what George Gammon is having on Twitter yesterday and today. And, you know, we love George. I, th I think his explanations of the economy and just how clearly he explained, I mean, it's three simple steps, got the whiteboard. Like he, he's a great educator. Seems like a really good guy. Um, you know, one of our advisors and friends, Lynn works with him on research reports and does all kinds of stuff with them. So we know he's a good dude, 
what he's doing kind of in real time and it's fun like go in and engage and and see how people are answering you know see people that are being polite and people that are not being polite and kind of judge who you want to follow but he's asking a lot of questions about bitcoin yesterday and today and he wants to understand it more deeply some of it may be a little bit of you know sort of engagement trolling and that's okay twitter that sh that shit happens um but one of the things he asked was with me he was engagement trolling me on a telephone call right <laughs> So exactly. So at one point, this is 45 minutes ago, he said, I'm more concerned with the questions I haven't asked, which is exactly what you were hitting. And, you know, my, my response there was, you know, thousands of people have been cranking their brains trying to shrink that, you know, what they call fourth quadrant, not the hedge eye version of it, but unknown unknowns. This is something that was in the yeah. lexicon, but yeah. popularized by Donald Rumsfeld 20 years ago. Um, but we've been trying to shrink that fourth quadrant for 12 years and trying to think of all of those questions, all of those threats, all of those things that might really negatively affect Bitcoin or take Bitcoin down in some way. And I was like, it's getting really, really hard to find anything worrisome that doesn't already have a great answer. I actually can't think of anything anymore. There's like nothing left. That's bullish. It's that is, that is HODL FOMO time. <laughs> like if somebody's not, you know, you can't force somebody to give up their fiat money addiction, right? Yeah. If they're addicted to fiat money, they have to decide for themselves that they've hit fiat money bottom. You can't get somebody to 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 come to Bitcoin uh, sobriety mm -hmm. uh, who's addicted to fiat money. You know, they have to do it themselves. They have to hit bottom. You can lead you know, him. Grandpa, he's looking at his retirement checks. He can't afford a mutual, you know, Wheaties anymore. He's like, I'm hitting fiat money bottom. I need, I need help. You know, your teenagers, you give them their their allowance and they can't buy crack anymore. They fit fiat money bottom. They're ready to accept <laughs> Bitcoin, the solution. They're ready to accept it. You can make them sound even, money, but you can't make them lower their time preference, huh? And even after you hit sound. Uh, fiat bottom, like you can still relapse by going into trading and like still using dollars as your unit of account. And so like, you know, I've, I've talked to some friends in the last week where like, maybe I should sell a little bit, take a little bit off the table right now. Like, what are you selling into? <laughs> You're selling in dollars again? Come on. I that is such a Bitcoin good point. In the bull market, you don't hear as many people talking about Lamborghinis because they realize that that's a really stupid use case for their Bitcoin. So I have a slightly funny idea, which is usually my ideas are only slightly funny. Max, would you mind uh, saying to, his name is Bennett. Would you just say, Bennett, buy some fucking Bitcoin already or something along those lines? Is that your grandfather's name? That's his name. Look, you freaking, uh, no. Bennett. <laughs> uh, you know, so how do, we, how do we orange pill Bennett? You know, I would say that he, of his generation, you know, and it, it, it's the greatest, uh, the, the movement of this, this generation of Americans have seen the, the man landing on the moon. They've seen American ingenuity. They've seen what a free people can do powered with, with uh, principles and first principles. And we've lost our way, Bennett. We've lost our way now. We, 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 we are not the country or the world we once were. Why is that? Because we've gone into this fiat standard. Bennett, you know, as you know, the, the dollar today doesn't buy as much as it did 10, 20 years ago. Where is that purchasing power going? Where is it shrinking? Well, we ask our government for help, and where are they? they they're, they're mired in their, in their own nonsense. Are they performing for us? Uh, where's our elected representatives? We have to take power off for ourselves. And you know, Bennett, as well as anybody, that the individual has the power to make significant change. And we become sovereign individuals by taking that whole idea of money and bringing it to ourselves. We can own unconfiscatable, uncensorable money in a way that gives us agency to express our greater selves. The angels of our better nature can express themselves only through the hardest money ever seen. And this is the ultimate American trip, Bennett. Take a ride with us to the land where freedom rings. Oh, man. Folks at home, uh, Max just came off another show. Apparently had a, a even more epic rant. So he, he, it's, it's in his system right now. We're, any, anytime he starts ranting, we're just going to let him do his thing because uh, well, mostly because I enjoy it. and I don't care if anyone else does. So whew. flawless. Thank you for that. That was, uh, that was wonderful. We, um, 
we need to touch on something that Corey brought up earlier, though. I think it's an important concept that's kind of a, a merging of two concepts, and it's it's hodl FOMO. It's and I like to call it a hodl FOMO wave that's going to come. And I think it was our own citizen Bitcoin who brought this to the fore. But Reed, can you uh, give the folks at home a bit of a breakdown of of what hodl FOMO means and why it's important going forward? <laughs> Uh, sure. My, my understanding, typical FOMO is sort of a trading mindset uh, in that you're scared the price is going to run up and that you need to get some immediately. Um, and so you try and do whatever you can as quickly as you can to, to purchase Bitcoin. And you're uh, making trade decisions based on your emotions, which is never a good idea. Uh, HODL FOMO, sort of the idea that uh, you actually have no idea where the price is going to go in the short term and it could go up very, very quickly. In the short term, and so you have you're scared to sell essentially because you recognize the fundamentals are so strong that in the long run it's going up. Short term, you have no idea, but you do not ever want to sell your Bitcoin, and you're scared to sell your Bitcoin um, because its purchasing power at any moment could go up ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent, and and we've seen that happen historically. One hundred percent. I mean, anytime someone talks about this, I'm immediately thinking of the Matrix meme about how you know Neo is like you know you're. One day I'll be able to sell my Bitcoin for millions, and uh, you know, no Neo saying that you won't have to. Oh, I forgot we actually have uh, Keanu with us. He could have done a great. great that, I think that was before we ever even knew each other. That was like our first collab, basically. Basically, <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll we'll put that video out again. We 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 actually redubbed the scene, and it was a lot of fun. But ladies and gents, we have another fabulous person joining us. Kristen Thompson, welcome to the show. How are you Thank today? Thank you. I'm in, my, I'm in a post-Thanksgiving stupor, but glad to be here. Well, before you joined us, we, uh, we were discussing that. So you got to tell us, what was your favorite dish of the meal? And yeah, your favorite dish of the meal. Well, I, I'm in some keto shame here because I heard about the keto pumpkin pie. I went hard off keto. I ate stuffing. I ate mashed potatoes. I ate turkey. And it came out perfectly because none of my relatives were here. So I had no one to impress. So it was literally our best Thanksgiving meal ever. <laughs> Just me and my son and my hubs, but we had a great, great night together. Oh, I love that. It's, it is interesting. I, you know, I did Thanksgiving with my brother and his girlfriend and it was just us. And while it was sad that we couldn't be with our family, it was slightly less stressful. So. Way less stressful. Yes. <laughs> so that, that's all right. Um, we had a question from the audience that I'm, that I want to find and I'm struggling to find it. So what I'm while doing- you look for it, Kristen is new to the show. We just want to hear, we've obviously all been fans of yours on Bitcoin Twitter and we all engage a lot. And I know you've talked to Jan quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and you are certainly a swan booster and a Bitcoin booster. Tell us a little bit sure. about yourself and your business. Well, I've had a business. I started it in the last recession. Um, I had worked in media sales for many, many years. And then when I gave birth to my son, I wanted to launch my own business. And I did. And I specialize in helping other entrepreneurs grow their business by using speaking. So going out to events and conferences and speaking online and webinars and all the stuff that I hope I get Swan doing to grow your business too. But more to the point was um, I really fell in love with Bitcoin in 2017. My, my husband mentioned it to me in the hallway over there and I stopped him dead in the hallway and I was like, what? Why haven't you told me about this sooner? And I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. I watched all of Andreas's videos. Um, I started reading as much as I could. And I say this as like, I am a total normie. So I can't, um, I'm not in the FinTech world. I don't know anything about investing. Um, so I come at this from just being a business owner and I've had my funds frozen by my merchant account before you know, hosting a live event and having a lot of funds come in all at once. And then they just lock your funds down for 30 days while they play with it. And so there was things that just grabbed me about Bitcoin right away, um, just as a business owner. And then seeing how far it could go just in terms of um, its value increasing over the years, I couldn't believe that my husband hadn't told me about it sooner. Frankly, there was a little bit of an argument in that hallway. Like, what? What? Why have you been keeping this under wraps for so long? Um, 
But the other amazing thing is just the community. You know, Bitcoin Twitter is amazing. And I've learned so much just the other day. I was saying, okay, I saved up some some money and, you know, my business set it aside to put into Bitcoin. Bitcoin was flying up and I was frozen. And I was like, hey, Bitcoin Twitter, what do I do? I've got this money set aside. Uh, the price of Bitcoin is flying up. And people were so cool giving, giving me their advice to just keep DCAing in which made me laugh because we know I'm a big fan of Swan. And I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> just just increase the frequency. It's going to be okay. So, was that the um, prevailing uh, uh, advice from most people? Yes, yes. I think like 90% of people said, just keep DCAing, but do it more frequently and maybe increase you know the amount that you're saving. Because I already had a weekly amount set through Swan and um, I don't know why it didn't occur to me. <laughs> That's what that's what you guys are for, but I'll it was such a why. simple answer. It's, why? It's, it's because with Swan, you set it and forget it. You know, you don't have to think about it, so you stop thinking about it. You go out and enjoy your life. It's great. It really is true, and that's what I was laughing. I told my husband later. I'm like, I guess it really it's true. I don't. I like literally don't think about it. It comes out every week, especially when quarantine hit. I live in Portland, Oregon, so we locked down pretty early. I was like, all the money that we would have spent going out to dinner, we're just going to just start siphoning that into our Swan savings account. It was like, we didn't even have to think about it. But then the minute I had this like other little chunk that I had generated, I challenged myself, go sell something in your business, put all of that into Bitcoin. But again, I just kind of like freaked out when the price started going up. But this community is great. If you follow the right people and you swim in the right pool, you know, you'll really be supported as again, as someone who's not technical and knows very little on that side. Um, I, I am smart enough to know who to trust in and that's done me really well. And, and this crowd is is definitely the place to be. Well, you're definitely on the coolest show in all of Bitcoin right now. I don't know how it happened, but you know, thanks for having me. <laughs> Possibly tied with orange pill. Sorry, I take that back. Um, <laughs> So we had a we had a question from the from from hi there one two three um, and it was it looked like an important one so I think we should address it. It is, what's your opinion on the debt markets in a Bitcoin standard? Um, and I think this is a really interesting question. And it's actually something I think that that, that Satoshi and Hal discussed many many years ago, but a lot of people don't know. Um, speaking about you know second layer and and banks issuing Bitcoin backed money and things like that. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how I feel about it. You know, I think it's going to happen, but, uh, I, I think, I think this is a question for Max first, and then I want to go to Mr. Stephen Cole afterwards. Um, and Stacy, I feel like you, you and Max are one brain. So if you want to take it, just go for it. <laughs> I usually, I, I speak over him. As soon as he starts to speak, I'll interrupt him. <laughs> oh, wait, I have, to, I have to interrupt. I have to interrupt. It's called marriage. <laughs> I have to interrupt real quick. Earlier, um, Stacy, you did a fantastic Max impression, um, and I wanted to ask Max, do you have a good Stacy impression? No. Again, I refer back to it's called marriage. <laughs> so um, let me, if I understand the question correctly, did you say that, what about the debt market? So uh, in, in a society with a Bitcoin standard, would we still have the same propensity for for taking on debt and issuing loans and what would it look like in comparison to what we have going on today? Yeah, no, it wouldn't because in the fiat money world, it's very easy to create debt. I mean, all because all fiat money is debt based. And as a matter of fact, to keep the debt Ponzi scheme going, you have to keep creating more debt based Ponzi money, right? So it's not equity, it's debt. It's the, the, the U S dollar is, is, is loaned into existence. It, it, it enters life as debt. And the interest on that debt, it keeps requiring that more of this debt money be issued. It's a classic Ponzi scheme. And if you look at the structured debt market, let's say the government debt market in the United States, you know, the, the debt, the bond market has not been this high in 240 years. And if you look at the United Kingdom, the debt market in the UK has not been this high in 300 years. So you talk about a bubble. The 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 sovereign debt bubble is in multi hundred year highs. It, it's an incredibly overextended uh, because the central banks 
buy back the, their own debt by issuing more debt paper. Mm -hmm. So the balance sheet of those central banks are now in the multi-trillions of dollars. And so at some point, the question will become, well, who's going to bail out the central banks? Because they're, they're going to need a bailout. And they're sitting on tens of trillions of dollars worth of worthless paper that they carry on the books for 100 cents on the dollar. But that implies that they could sell that debt for 100 cents on the dollar. But we, we know that the market for that debt is less than three cents on the dollar. So that the Federal Reserve Bank is leveraged much higher today than Enron was shortly before it evaporated in one day. Enron became an $80 billion, you know, uh, disappeared, a hologram. Enron was a financial hologram. The central banks are financial holograms. They, they're, they're debt, they, they call it quantitative easing, but quantitative easing, the only difference between quantitative easing and debt monetization is that in quantitative easing, we're, we're told that it's temporary. <laughs> well, now, you know, it's 20 years later. Uh, they, they're just expanding it. The amount of money that was created this 2020 uh, of debt money in the U.S., of all the debt created in America's history, 20% of it was created in, the, in 2020. Mm -hmm. If you look at that chart of the rise of M2, money supply, which is based all on debt, it's vertical on the way up. Okay, let's look at another chart, the velocity of money, which, which tells you how the economy is doing, how banks are loaning to other banks because there's a demand by small to medium enterprises. It's hitting all time near lows. It's almost at zero. So structurally, this, this tells you the system is completely broken. It's being sustained through the machinations of debt monetization and the holographic paradigm of central banking and as long as there's nobody to compete with that, they can get away with it. There's gold, but gold is highly centralized. Mm -hmm. It's not, doesn't really trade freely. Okay, enter into this Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the central bank killer. Bitcoin is the pin. Central banks are the bubble. And every fiat money in the world is in a hyperinflationary collapse against Bitcoin. Right. So when you say, what will the debt picture be in a post Bitcoin or hyper Bitcoinization world, it would be um, instead of having a debt to GDP on planet Earth of over 300 percent, which is the current number. Right? The, the GDP of planet Earth is about 90 to 100 trillion and it's carrying debt in excess of 300 trillion. So in a Bitcoinization world, it would be more like one for one or one point two to one. Right, you still have there's still a role for borrowing money, okay. But you would have a debt to GDP of, of uh one to one or maybe less than one to one, but it wouldn't be you wouldn't be uh you know, and surrounding all that debt, um, Brecky is the derivative market, right? So the way to manage the debt market is through derivatives, and the derivative market is now over two trillion. An example would be the oil market, quadrillion, you mean. Yeah, two, I mean, two trillion two, is I'm like sorry. that's what you mean. Yeah, two, two quadrillion. I'm sorry, two quadrillion. <laughs> so, in in look at the oil market. For every barrel of oil in the world, it's the most commonly traded commodity in the world. There are sixty thousand barrels in derivatives. And look at gold. Same thing. Not as bad. Same thing. So this this is the derivative sphere of two quadrillion in paper money that has no resale value whatsoever. It's that except to each other. So once that bubble is popped, you have this thing. You know, the, the, you hear in the in the words from the IMF now and, and these other organizations, they say we need a big global reset. So what does that mean? But well, the last big global reset was Bretton Woods after World War Two. And uh, then in 1971, America defaulted on its obligations to Britain and by closing the gold window. So America defaulted in 1971 on its on its sovereign debt. And so since 71 to today, we've had the fiat standard and now it's, it's totally hit its breaking point. You know, there's, there's comes a point of saturation where you simply cannot, and you see it happening on the street, you know, the, the riots on the street and the social unrest is because there's many, many, many people now that have been cut off from the system and they're unhappy about it. And, and, and that trend is, 
not going to change anytime soon. There is no reset coming. There is no social program. There is no bailout. There is no bail in. There's not going to be any forgiveness of student debt that's meaningful in any way. There's no policies that can be enacted. There's we're too far into the forest. Uh, it's now it's 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 Bitcoin time. It's going to be either you're on the Bitcoin arc and you're rising above this sea of fiat money shit. Or you're in the sea of fiat money shit. That, that's it. You know, we the, the, the ARC is still taking passengers. You can still book your passage on the Bitcoin ARC right now. That's Swan. Uh, at some point, when the institutions start scooping up coins off the uh, miners and they never enter the market, you're not going to find Bitcoin. It's going to be hard to get Bitcoin. You won't get any at, at this price. But I also might add on top of that, because they're asking about that second layer and lightning network. And now we have a reference rate and we can create sort of the equivalent of a treasury market in in Bitcoin is um, the system that we know and that we're exiting and the fiat dark ages that are over. That was built on top of gold, which was um, perfect money for thousands of years. And it started out as gold. And then, as Max mentioned, it got consolidated and centralized <clears throat> because of the nature of how difficult it is to store and carry and transfer and the, the need to, um, <clears throat> you know, you couldn't just transfer it globally during globalization from China to the United States and back and forth and back and forth, right? So it became centralized. But this huge financial system built on top of it. And then in 1971, they all had so much debt that instead of just um, restarting, they figured, let's see if we could trick everybody and pull us off the gold standard and pretend we have something new. Um, right. Maybe something like that might happen on Bitcoin, um, but it's not centralized like gold and it doesn't need to be and not your keys, not your coin. And you could pull your keys off these markets. So it's not like governments can centralize it and control it and, and, and like create a system whereby they bail out people on who do develop debts on top of a Bitcoin standard, people are, are the same throughout history. They're going to rack up too many debts and it's going to be politically connected people who rack up too many debts. But we've already seen this in Bitcoin. You know, the users control Bitcoin. It's not some guy named Jerome Powell that gets to say, hey, we're going to bail out you know, Corey Clipson, because he's a OG Bitcoiner and we're going to bail him out. Like people are going to go like the user activated um, like anti Corey <laughs> bailout are going to be like, no, we're not going to, we're going to like make sure we don't bail out that person. So uh, that's what will happen with, you know, there will naturally develop a system on top of Bitcoin that is similar to what happened with gold, but you can't, you can't manipulate it like the central banks have. Yeah. Plus fiat money encourages really bad behavior Yeah, mm -hmm. and Bitcoin encourages good behavior um, because in the case of fiat money, the way to get more fiat money a lot of times is coercion or violence. Look at America's foreign policy. Okay, we want somebody's oil. We send in the Marines. We kill a lot of people. With Bitcoin, because it's unconfiscatable, the only way you can get any more Bitcoin from me is to offer me something I'm willing to trade for in Bitcoin. So you've got to be nice to me and say, look, I made this artwork or something. I have a service. You know, you can't beat it out of me because it's unconfiscatable. And, and, and look at the kind of p person that's developed during the fiat money world, like a Warren Buffett, for example, who has a lot of money, you know, 80 billion or something, but he's, he's spiritually dead. And the, the man doesn't leave Omaha, Nebraska. He, he, has, he, he went once to Hong Kong with, with Bill Gates. And the first thing he did is he went to the Hong Kong McDonald's with a coupon he got in uh, Omaha, Idaho, Idaho, Nebraska, Nebraska, and he and he tried to get a discount on a cheeseburger <laughs> on his trip to Hong Kong. That that that's Warren Buffett's mentality, right? So what's the point of having? He's like an old lady, but he's been bailed out five times. He's been bailed out five times. It's like a, the the old lady with like the the living room stacked with telephone books that she's keeping for for decades, right? He just stacks paper, you but know, he's he's a moron. And he doesn't have anything to say other than, well, I get bailed out all the time. I've got $80 billion. I'm giving it all away. And how do I get a cheaper hamburger in Hong Kong? Like, what's the point of that? So, you know, with Bitcoin, you see people are incentivized to do great art. I mean, this is an artistic revolution in Bitcoin. Look at all this great art that's being generated because people are looking past this whole paper chase. They're like, I need spiritual sustenance. 
If I can get some Bitcoin to live on by generating great art, I'm happy, totally happy. That's a totally different mindset. A hundred percent. I mean, it's it's an interesting thing that you brought up also that, that governments can't do anything about it. And I, I, I agree with you. Um, but I do think that we do have to consider the, and I, I think it's kind of inevitable that they're going to try, you know, they're going to do that. They, they recognize how powerful Bitcoin is. So, you know, to, to everyone who's watching this, you know, it's important that we promote the, the, that people have to run their own nodes and take the control of their own keys. You know, if, if everyone leaves their money on Coinbase, then, you know, the, the government can go in and, and scoop it up. So, you know, we need to be diligent, diligent, vigilant. I can't talk today. Um, and it, this kind of brings me to, um, I don't know if everyone saw the smoke screen. I mean, uh, tweet storm that uh, Brian Armstrong put out yesterday. Um, but it, I, do, I, I don't know. I, I really want to spend some time on this issue. You know, um, so Raul Paul put out a tweet um, and he, he said, if you think that secrecy from governments and no KYC is Bitcoin's future, then you don't understand what adoption looks like. They will regulate it. You will declare it. You will have to do KYC and that is fine. It doesn't take away its store of value, but just integrates it. And I thought that Alex Gladstein had a really interesting response to this, which was, okay, so what about encrypted communications? People said, said this in the early 90s. There must be backdoors. Well, guess what? The cypherpunks won. Now we can all use Signal. Please don't be on the wrong side of this fight. Bitcoin is about privacy and freedom, not institutional adoption. Um, I think Alex is right in a lot of ways here. Um, I, I don't think Bitcoin can be stopped, but we all need to kind of pull together and and be good Bitcoiners, you know? Um, I don't know. I want to know if anyone has any thoughts on this. Stephen, I feel like this is a great topic for you. Yeah, for sure. And I saw Raul's tweet as well and thought a lot about it. And I'm optimistic that there isn't as much of a divide or um, a dichotomy between these two different futures of the cypherpunk permissionless uh, vision of Bitcoin and then this sort of like number go up finance bro, whatever the terminology is that's being thrown around for it, institutional Bitcoin. Um, I do see a lot of tension around that. I could see in the next couple of years, a lot of heated dialogues, maybe some more fork wars and thought along those lines between those two groups. But I'm optimistic that there is this path forward in which institutional money does flood into Bitcoin and maybe the grayscales of the world and the coin bases of the world increase their holdings through that process. Um, but that ultimately we can kind of maintain the ethos behind Bitcoin and raise awareness to everyone of the importance of full nodes, of decentralization, of the, the real fundamentals behind Bitcoin's value prop that made the $200 billion worth of value that's in it today get there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And if at any point there were you know, uh, a threat of a hard fork, then I think that we would have another maybe UASF, uh, New York Agreement, Segwit2x type of scenario. But, um, but I don't, I also don't see a future in which Bitcoin is really successful without institutional adoption. Uh, and this may be kind of a controversial point. So I want to be sure to, to give it the nuance that it deserves. But I think on the cypherpunk side, there's some people who think like, you know, you should never have hedge funds in this. You should never have institutional money in this. And like KYC is evil all the time. And I don't think that that's the case. I think that in order to really get the trillions of dollars worth of wealth that are out there in the world into Bitcoin and to really provide a powerful check on central banks, on government overreach, on government power, you do need those trillions to come into the system. You just need to do it in a way in which it does not sacrifice any of Bitcoin's, uh, you know, uncensorability, unconfiscatability, and its limited supply. 100%. You know, so Marty Bent actually wrote about this in his Bent. In, Marty Bent wrote about it in his Bent today. I say that 10 times fast. Um, and I really liked what he was saying, that the thinking of people like Raul on this, and I think Not So Fast had something similar to say, is that it's really kind of, fiat based defeatist thinking, you know, Bitcoin is this unstoppable force. And if you are still thinking in the paradigms of the old world, well, you're going to get left behind and probably proven wrong. So, um, 
I wanted to bring this up. It was a little bit of a downer, but I hope it ends up as a bit of an uh, as a uh, as a positive thing because I thoroughly disagree with it. And Stephen, yeah. Well, you, know, you know, uh, you know that Raul. uppers uppers yeah. were words before they were taken by pills, right? You can just say upper. Yeah, okay. I have. <laughs> you know, this Raul, you know, it's a good example of what Corey uh, told me something a while ago, orange washing, right? Ooh. Where on one hand he comes out, he's all like, oh, Bitcoin is great. And then you get behind the paywall and it's a shitcoin casino. So there's that, there's that piece to it. That's kind of like bad, a bad actor right there. Then he's like, well, we need regulators to pay for the roads and collect taxes. Well, get out of your tax haven in the Cayman Islands, you duplicitous cunt. Okay, that would be, excuse me, I didn't mean to say that. That Use that coarse language. Uh, so thirdly, um, you know, it's, uh, he in effect is a useful idiot because we do need the trillions to come into the space. And, it, you know, I would, I would position him as a tourist. You know, he's a Bitcoin tourist. He comes in, he's got some money, he can supply some buying power, but he's got he's got no reason to say anything. Like just quietly buy the Bitcoin for your fund and don't say anything. That would be great, Raul. Just <laughs> STF you and you know, get we'll take your buying power, but please shut up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, we went full screen. I think they were waiting for you to start. Right. No, I, that's shouting it. about STF. I'm you. not gonna. I've, I've, I've over allocated my 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 profanity quotient for this show. I don't want to. I don't want to offend anybody. It's All right. Well, I've, I've been on a little bit of a rant this morning, just kind of like picking up on some of the stuff because you know, I mean, we've had Rel on the show, and he's been broadly. You know, like you have to admit that outside of the work that Max and Stacy have done for the last, you know, decade, I would say recently, probably Pomp and Raul have been, you know, the most effective top of funnel people that are kind of newer. And so you got to kind of appreciate it uh, to some degree while quibbling with them when they do stupid things. Like it's annoying that Pomp doesn't necessarily prepare for interviews with shitcoin founders and basically lets them do infomercials on his platform that continues to be super annoying. Um, and obviously it's dumb if Raul gets drunk like he did last night and says, I'm starting to warm to XRP. Like that's just <laughs> straight up irresponsible. Like you kind of have a responsibility. Or we just assume he was drunk. Uh, well, he, he used that as the excuse after saying it. Um, so who knows? Probably was, but nevertheless, like keep the warm feeling in your belly. Don't, you know, put poop in your belly. Like you can have a warm feeling without getting involved in XRP. But anyway, I mean, I think, you know, I, I said, if you if you want to profit from speaking publicly about Bitcoin, understand that Bitcoiners will hold you accountable and, you know, parroting narratives without understanding them as a short term strategy. Deep understanding lets you separate reality from hopium and basic FUD, like fear, uncertainty and doubt. And when people really deeply understand Bitcoin, they don't need the hopium. And obvi obviously, it's really easy to be beat back the stupid FUD and these like, oh no, are these, you know, unknown unknowns like George is asking about. It's like, well, no, we've been spending all of our time, 50 hours a week, you know, for three and a half years for me, for 10 years for people like Max, you know, digging in, standing on the shoulders of giants that have looked into these things. And it's the age of the internet. So we all have access to the best answers for every single concern. So stop concern trolling when you haven't done the research, have some humility when you come engage with Bitcoiners and spend some time learning and maybe you'll actually start writing amazing pieces and contributing something new instead of just fudding in front of your audience and making yourself look stupid in front of Bitcoiners. And yes, you'll get some like engagement so you can go and like sell some gold or some shit coins or whatever, but you know, you're essentially trashing your long-term reputation and we know what you're doing. So we're not going to trust you. And we're moving to a society in which everything is based on trust because we are, you know, the, the foundational layer of our society going forward is the frickin trust machine. And you're throwing away your reputation over some clicks and some ad dollars from some crypto bullshit businesses. You know, like that's what RV crypto is. It's really annoying. I'm, I'm personally like offended by the monetization of Bitcoiners you know, who are watching Real Vision and you're going to turn around like you, you make plenty of money from great macro content or whatever you're doing on the on the normie investment side of things you know, have some editorial control, take some responsibility. Don't just pretend to be like an open forum, like your agenda and your voice, the point of view that you're taking when you are a publisher literally is 
who you choose to give your platform to. That is the editorial control that you have. That is your point of view is who you give your platform to. Um, so I, I don't think that you can just punt and say like, let's not be tribal and, you know, let's all just get along and, you know, hey, I've got some, you know, tidbits for the Bitcoin maxis here, which is, you know, disrespectful on its face using terminology like that, which he did when he announced Real Vision Crypto last week or two weeks ago, the most recent one. It's like you're literally your first guest. Your your host is a noted, notable shit coiner out of Australia. Your first guest is Vitalik. And you're going to promote that episode by saying Bitcoin Maxi. You know, like you're making so many missteps. It's clear you're surrounding yourself with people that are uh, not Bitcoiners and don't have Bitcoin's interests in mind. Anyway, you know, the second tweet that I put out today was... Um, actually before that, which is, you know, the biggest realization of macro slash investing influencers in 2020 was not that they should buy Bitcoin. It's that their media businesses make much more money when they talk about Bitcoin. And as usual with social media, engagement is the goal, not accuracy. Anyway, end rant. Yeah, well, with um, with Raul, I mean, to be fair, you know, he is he's not a strategic guy in the space, you know, and he's, he's having some fun too. Whereas uh, Brian Armstrong is strategic and he does what he says. That seemed like FUD when he came out there and started tweeting about Steve Mnuchin might come in and outlaw non-custodial wallets. And, 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 you know, I'm beginning to uh, have some feelings about this, right? Because he is actually part of the, interface between Bitcoin and Washington, D.C., because it's a huge company. They're probably going to go public soon. And so that's that's kind of more problematic to me. Like Raul is somebody that will probably get into some flame wars about, but it, he's not really part of the strategic core of what's going on here, whereas Brian Armstrong is. And I thought his, his remarks, you know, his tweet storm seemed interesting because at the same time, the uh, the regulators cut back on them from doing any margin trading. Uh, there was something going on there. They were the first guys to give uh, the IRS information about their accounts over there at Coinbase. That was not good. That, that was something going on. So Brian, he's the most disingenuous person, one of the most disingenuous people in all of crypto. And I hate to use the word crypto, but crypto. He, like you said, like they're in bed with the IRS. They're selling tools to the government agencies to track everyone. Okay, fine, whatever. Like I, I could, I, I expected that from them to be honest. So like it, it, it doesn't bother me that much. I mean, it does, but like par for the course for them. But you know, that tweet storm. He comes out with these with these tweet storms with these threads when it suits them. You know, it's frankly, I think it was it was smokescreen for the, uh, the the New York Times article today. But that's a whole other issue. Um, but I don't know. You, you look even look at the thread. He was talking about eCash in the thread. He used it did an example. Like, well, like really, Brad. Like, yeah, I, I agree with that very much. And I was quick to thank Brian on Twitter for sharing what he shared about the regulation. And then after doing so, just kind of reread the thread a couple more times and just felt less and less of him every time. It's like, even if he is trying to share something that ends up being valid about some incoming regulation, he just did it in the scummiest way possible with all these examples about DeFi and you are like links, like you said, to Bitcoin cash projects in the thread, not really mentioning Bitcoin itself at all. And then hours later, we find out it may just be to distract from uh, an article about a different topic on Coinbase the following day. So, uh, so yeah, I felt much worse. I was trying to give Brian the benefit of the doubt right out the gate on that one and quickly didn't feel good about it. Hmm. Yeah, I uh, I gave up on giving. He 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 gets no more doubt benefits for me. For sure. But, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I will say um, as the sole it, normie on the thread that that's why I'm so glad that Swan Bitcoin exists for people like me, where you have a safe place to go. Yeah, that's for sure. Coinbase's incentives are you for are for you to go there and trade a bunch of shit coins, and then they fleece you on fees as you, you know, venture through that world. So Bitcoin only is the way to go. <laughs> and then I, the 
IRS fleeces you on taxes for moving in and out of all these different assets. Oh. <laughs> and base hands over all that information to them. So double whammy twice. <laughs> It is true. You know, so there's actually there's an interesting side convo going on in the uh, in the chat here. And we're talking about all these money managers and these billionaires and all these things. And I, I don't know where the comment is, but basically the question was, you know, are these people important? Um, and I think it's it's an interesting thing to talk about. You know, personally, I think they're both important and unimportant. Um, the more people that own Bitcoin, the more billionaires put billions of dollars into Bitcoin. But, you know, I think the stronger Bitcoin is as we move forward. But at the end of the day, Bitcoin doesn't care. Bitcoin's the honey badger that doesn't give a shit about these people. And it doesn't care about us, doesn't care about billionaires, doesn't care about the plebs. Bitcoin will keep on churning out blocks every 10 minutes. So they matter and they don't matter. Um, if anyone wants to comment on that, we can. But there was another comment. I think um, that, you know, Michael Saylor, if he has, say, 40,000 Bitcoin between his company and himself, he doesn't matter any more than somebody with less than one Bitcoin does in terms of the power that they have over the consensus algorithm or protocol or anything like they have no power more. He has no more power than somebody with one Bitcoin to determine the whether a fork happens or something. Um, but in terms of um, there are some investors that matter more than others, like so I would say Abby Johnson of Fidelity, you know, uh, she's been very quiet, but behind the scenes and has, she's, I, I would I would guess that Fidelity is a bigger whale than Michael Saylor, but is quiet about it because they've been mining since 2014. She's running um, the mining operation for them, right? She's, on she's the what? She's on the mining team for them. Like she heads mining. For she's Fidelity? the CEO of Fidelity, oh, okay. which uh, manages uh, over $4 trillion. They're a huge asset manager. Uh, private, so they're not even publicly listed and don't have to uh, reveal any of this sort of information about like how much Bitcoin they have. Um, so she was very early in 2014 and at a time for somebody like a massive bank like that, that they got involved so early and so deep, you know, when the majority of the, the JP Morgans and stuff of the world were saying this is for terrorists and, and drug dealers and stuff like that is remarkable. That's like, um, they have a deep understanding. There's a deep institutional understanding of Bitcoin at somewhere like Fidelity. BlackRock got a lot of attention because they're a bit, they're almost twice as big and they're publicly listed and they're, you know, they're, um, they're very open and public and they're on CNBC, whereas Abby Johnson and Fidelity don't go on uh, CNBC. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that sort of institutional money is important in terms of, you know, their clients are extremely wealthy sort of family offices and people like that, which, you know, at, at, at the edge, th those people have been pretty early anyway into Bitcoin. But, you know, Max will tell you because he knows, well, he was on Wall Street when Paul Tudor Jones was the king. Those sort of guys, there are certain hedge fund managers. I mean, I, I still think P Paul Tudor Jones has said way more, like the most profound thing about Bitcoin beyond anything. Michael Saylor says a lot. He's on a lot of podcasts and he's a, a very interesting guy and has definitely gone like full in on Bitcoin in a really impressive way. But Paul Tudor Jones is somebody who is, um, Max could speak more to it, but as a what he is as a hedge fund manager. But when he said, recently on CNBC, I think it was, or Bloomberg, where he said after studying, after getting involved in Bitcoin in the second quarter and then studying it and watching it, you know, the fact that it's, that he says it's a, it's a bet on humanity is like shocking that somebody who could, he can come in and see that, like, but elaborate more, Max, on Paul Tudor Jones in particular. Uh, well, he, he said that, you know, when you're buying gold, it's kind of a bet on things falling apart. And when you're buying Bitcoin, it's a bet on it's pro humanity. You know, I thought that was really, really profound in a lot of ways. It's like a very Bitcoiny thing to say. And uh, but as far as all these this money coming in, I think for the hodler and for the dollar cost averaging customer on Swan, it's great to see big money there, right? So you don't you're not just you and your, you know, dollar cost averaging at a at a rate that you know it's a, you know it's great to see huge multi trillionaires coming in. It's great to know that. There's four, four folks. You got Digital Currency Group, um, you've got uh, Cash App, and you've got PayPal, 
and you've got uh, one other of the big four, and they're they're buying 35, 3,600 coins a day, right? And the mining output's 900. So it's great to see that. I mean, it help, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see it. You know, I don't think they ultimately impact what the future is for Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin will keep going even if humans become extinct. There'll still be blocks every 10 minutes. <laughs> so it doesn't need humans at all. Yeah. Right. And, and I, mean, I really get energy from the sun and you can keep, you know, difficulty adjustment <laughs> would, would, uh, would adjust and they'd be hashing blocks and we'd be, we'd be long gone. <laughs> and know? on that note, check out some exchange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But so, so, so it doesn't really, they, we don't need them, but you know, it's great. To, it's great for the hodler, you know, up, up, it's a Michael Saylor was like the first time in the history that I've been involved with this project that I said to myself, Oh, I guess I'm not crazy. <laughs> Because up until then, there was a strong possibility that I was crazy. <laughs> and I think everyone else felt that. Like, you know what? We might all be crazy. I like and then this guy's like, no, I just put $425 million in. And because I've got this melting ice cube and it's my cash reserve and it's, you know, he talked about the 2017 hash war and it's the cyber hornets. And you're like, oh, my God, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. And not only am I not crazy, but this fucking thing's going to a million. <laughs> You know, Max, I, I, I'm going to disagree with you and say you are crazy, but I'm going to quote <laughs> from Alice in Wonderland and say that all the best people are, all of us included. All right, well, let's go from purple to orange there. Oh, <laughs> see, but all right, folks at home, see how mine are kind of like knockoff versions of those amazing glasses? Yeah. I'm going to keep shaming him. He won't tell me where he got them or he... I think you said you got them somewhere in Italy or something. I don't know. No, no, no. This one I got on Amazon for seven dollars. <laughs> are they Glow FX? We might have the same one. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah. are Glow FX. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. <laughs> this I found in a little awesome. shop on Villefranche sur Mer on the Côte d'Azur in the south of France, and it also cost seven dollars. But I could not. I can't find them on online. This um, this could be. It could just be the shape of his face. It could be. It was just, yeah. you know, they're built for sunglasses. <laughs> Perhaps. So if, you, if you're watching and you want to be as cool as Max and almost as cool as me, go on Amazon, buy some glasses. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to just, uh, yeah. Sailor, he seems to have like a new cool thing to say or a new narrative, you know, every couple of weeks and they, they make their, very recently, his last couple, he started to talk about Bitcoin as engineered money. And just how interesting that is to have a money that's actually created by, you know, the pinnacle of a long process of lots of engineers building different building blocks. And then obviously the final innovation of actually inventing Bitcoin, which was a lot of combinatorial creativity. But that concept of it being engineered money for the first time and engineered specifically for the purpose of being perfect money and how amazing that is and what a one time achievement that is. Um, yeah, but was it, it though? Like, was it more of an industrial accident like Velcro or Viagra? In other <laughs> words, the, the purpose of, for the cyberpunks was we're going to solve the double spend problem. And the, what they created, though, was perfect money. I, mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that that was the objective. So well, I think it was just an 21 million accident. deciding on a fixed supply as opposed to one that inflates means That's somebody read some Austrian paper. economics. That's not in the white paper. It's not in the white paper, but the white paper doesn't matter. What matters is the code. Uh, well, be that as it may, it was not articulated as such. And it, it was articulated to, in the code. To, 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 to have the double spend problem solved was this elegant and piece of engineering. And yeah. I think in, even in the early days, from 2009 to 2014, 20, it wasn't until 2016 that people started to talk about, you know what, this is better than gold. With, with a huge uh, kind of uh, backing with a with a with a big population, so it didn't. It wasn't even obvious in the first few years that the, the perfection of money that this was, right? Well, it, digital it, it, gold, it, the book it, that by came Daniel later. Popper that came, came out later. in 2014, and the Winklevi were buying it because it was digital gold. So it was it was the early narrative. There just weren't many people listening. Yeah. Well. Um, I, I would just nah. believe there's a wiggle room there to, 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 to. Yeah. There were a lot of people talking about payments and the VCs that, and, and, and that, stuff. Too. The reason why it's important is because I yeah. still think there's more to be revealed. Right. I still think yeah. that, 
as as close as we are to appreciating this as perfect money, perfect price discovery, perfect outcomes, and that word perfect sounds like you're, it's a finality to it. I, I still think we're gonna there's gonna be more revealed here. Uh, in the in, in the near term, where even even those those ideas are eclipsed by even more spectacular panoply of uh, of 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 kind of uh, fireworks of of outcomes that 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 are, that are just not even yet that, that's still to come. There's still mystery to it. I think once once yeah. you, once we start to say, oh, this is perfect, and it's you know it's like um, the Rodin, you know Rodin, the French sculptor. You know, very famously in his workshop in France, in Paris, his student came to him and said, Rodin, I've created the perfect masterpiece. And Rodin went over and he took a hammer and he knocked the arm off. And he said, ah, now it's art. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, perfection is not the goal. Although that's the outcome currently. There's something greater. We're on a caldera of a volcano about to explode in a spiritual epiphany that's going <laughs> to blow people's fucking socks off. <laughs> So to, uh, to add to this point, we don't know where it's going. I, I agree there's a lot left to be revealed. But how do we do that? All right, I'll tell you how we do that. What, we, what you do, sorry to be the shill, is you go to BitcoinDevList.com <laughs> and you please donate to Bitcoin development. Uh, and you can also uh, want to share one more of these links before we move on. You go to Brink.dev. I'm not sure if you can donate, but check it out. And support Bitcoin development as much as you can. Pretty, pretty, please. All right, I'm back. Done from Schiller. Uh, two things. One, one of the one of the things that I think uh, a phrase that encapsulates what Max is talking about, which I totally 100% agree with, is uh, is that it's network money. And this is something somebody mentioned in the chat, hoping that we'd talk about that concept of it being network money and that it would have emergent properties that we can't forecast. I think that's absolutely true. We can guess at some of these things, but there's so many things. And, and, you know, I, I have no business really telling you guys what people were talking about in 2012, 13, 14, 15, because I've only read about it. All I see is, you know, people looking back and they probably give themselves more credit today, you know, if they're not looking at the artifact of, of what was actually written at the time. You know, I think a lot of people were talking more about payments and, and that narrative back at the time, I, as we could see from the, yeah, it was all payments, right? Right. Um, so, so I totally hey. see the point. BitPay was the first company to jump into, you know, so we were investors in it BitPay. It was in 2011, yeah. 2011. So we were in the seed round of BitPay, and they were positioning themselves as PayPal of Bitcoin. And, and of course, the hard fork into, you know, the, the, the bastardizations of Bitcoin are all about payments and speed and all this other stuff. And that, that, and that happened with sincerity. You know, people be really believe that was the story, and that the, the the development was too slow, and the New York Agreement, and all those people, um, they actually believe that they 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 didn't see it, and that was in 2017. They didn't understand it. I mean, listen to Vitalik; he talks about he doesn't even understand how Bitcoin works. Mm -hmm. He doesn't because look at Ethereum. There's not, never been an audit. There's, nobody knows how many coins there are. They, they change the business model every six months. Totally buggy piece of shit. And he, and he, he talks shit. The guy doesn't even know. I mean, I talked to him when he was still at Bitcoin Magazine in London before Ethereum. He was pitching me on Ethereum. I'm like, that doesn't sound like it. That sounds like garbage. Did you see right? his tweet uh, a few days ago where he was he was I couldn't believe the irony of it. He was saying how uh, BSV is a cult of personality. And I was just like, and I, re I quoted it. I was like, Vitalik, Ethereum is a cult of personality. It started as one and it still is. Yeah. Okay. But definitely in those early days, like I remember uh, telling Max, I was so excited. I was like, oh my God, I got us two iPhones and it was only 14 Bitcoin. And like, like they sent, Apple sent us a freaking iPhone because right. there were all these like gift card uh, sort of things available. And that was in the UK. I bought it for 14 Bitcoin. I was like, I thought like, I can't believe like I can buy an iPhone. Like Apple was like one of the pinnacle products of like, this is amazing. And now I just always think of this 14 Bitcoin as it like ticks up higher and higher and going, I can't believe I spent like $260,000 on two fucking iPhones. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think it is super interesting to see people's understanding of Bitcoin evolve over time. And I feel like Bitcoin and, you know, Satoshi through it, 
might end up being the best economics teacher in the history of the world, um, the best teacher of money in the history of the world. Uh, I know when I first found Bitcoin in early 2013, it was all about payments for me, right? It's like, that's what money was. It's how I buy stuff day to day. And so I think that journey from seeing it as payments to, to the realization of some of the less obvious aspects of money, like savings. Like when you go to bed at night, you roughly expect your savings to be able to purchase as much stuff as it did when you went to sleep the night before. Sure. And, and that is arguably more important than spending, but we just don't think about it as much because we take it for granted. I mean, how Finney uh, like called it in 2009, he, he said like, this could be worth a hundred thousand a coin or more. Like, so he, he saw like, there are people that saw Trace Mayer. He was, uh, really early, at, 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 he was buying in at like 25 cents under a dollar mm -hmm. and um, he saw it as digital gold. Yeah. So there were people that could could see that it was going to be it. But the majority yeah. of the uh, of the Bitcoin conferences and conversation was about it being like a PayPal or Visa MasterCard. At that time, it was mostly about that. There were individuals for sure who saw it as um, that it would be a savings vehicle and uh, means like it, that it could replace the U.S. Treasury bond market, or things like that, like that. That there were very few who saw it like that. I mean, it's totally. the, it's five. It's the five blind men and, and, and an elephant. And I think this is yes. we talked about this last time. It's one of the reasons why I love Bitcoin is it's many different things to many different people, and that's a good thing. Bitcoin is whatever you want to use it for. You use it for, and no one's going to stop you, and no one can tell you not to. You want to use it for payments? Use it for payments. You know, it's it, it's a beautiful thing. You know, and I think also. I'm, a, I'm of the camp that I think right now, among other important aspects of Bitcoin, store value and savings is incredibly important. Censor, censorship resistance and hopefully privacy is getting better is, is incredibly important. And payments are also important, but they're like, to me, it's more of a downstream thing that's gonna come later. And you know if you look at how our current mon monetary system is set up, um, you know we have, the dollars that we have in our pockets that Max loves to tear up and we love to watch him tear up. Um, and then you have like treasury bills and like, it's right. It's a, it's a fakakta system. Like it's, it's really messed up. And what I'm excited about, and I don't know if I'll ever live to see it, but it doesn't matter is that we can build a different system that's built on a foundation of Bitcoin and have a better money uh, because of that, you know, and governments can take it or leave it, but those that adopt it will will benefit and their citizens will benefit. And you know, divorcing money from state is just it's it's a, it's a powerful thing. I don't know. Totally. And and I what I love especially about what you just said is the notion that anybody can run the experiment. So in the past, right, with monetary policy, when it's run by bureaucrats and run by governments and central banks everybody gets dragged along in a certain direction, right? And if 51% uh, thinks that money should be this way, then, oh, these crazy Austrian economists just kind of get ignored and, you know, they're off in their little corner and they're just dragged along into this world of debt and central banking. But now, thanks to the internet and code and, you know, decentralized open source and Bitcoin, we can run the experiment. Anybody can use Bitcoin in whatever way they think is valid. And if they disagree with the direction of Bitcoin enough, if they really have a different vision, then they can fork it and they can go their own direction and try to convince people to come along with them. But they cannot force anyone else to come along with them. So if you're Roger Veer and you think Bcash and payments are all the rage, then sure, you can fork it and you can go try, but you can't force the rest of us to come with you. And so that type of free market meritocratic uh, you know, environment, I think that's where we're gonna find out empirically what the best money is. 100%. Yeah. So we've got a quick question from the audience from Shabar. Uh, he's asking, uh, in a recent interview on Orange Pill, Sean Lennon mentioned a series on Bitcoin fe featuring Max Kaiser. Um, he wanted to know if you could actually tell us where you could find that. I'm not sure if you know which one he's referring to. Yes, you can find it on Bitcoin TV as well. It's it's to the moon. Ah, right. Okay, so to the moon. It's not on Bitcoin TV yet, but it's coming. Uh, yeah. For those who don't know what Bitcoin TV is, we'll do a little quick shill. Uh, I'm gonna pretend like I don't enjoy shilling, but I love it. <laughs> Bitcoin TV. Network, all Bitcoin, all the time. 
the only all Bitcoin TV network in the world, as far as I'm aware. Go watch it. Go check it out. And soon we will have To the Moon, which is a 10-part series about the first 10 years of Bitcoin by Max and Stacy. And I'm hoping, needling them to uh, make a next 10 years of Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's pretty good at capturing like... Um, because it's not in hindsight. You, you, we're, we're showing footage uh, live from back in 2011 and 2012 when like, we were the only media people really talking about it. So we were like that elephant trying to figure out what the heck we were talking about and what this was. So, I mean, you see some of these names like Barry Silbert at that time uh, in 2013 saying the steps, the next five steps that would happen. And they all have happened, by the way. He said exactly what would happen, what what players would enter the market, and that we could even see Bitcoin go to a $50 billion market cap. And they're talking mm -hmm. like, wow, that like, and at the time it was a $5 billion market cap. So it was already getting bigger. Yeah. And also because, you know, Bitcoin is the extraordinarily sophisticated technology on one hand, and television is about the dumbest medium in the world, on the other hand. So to mix those two is difficult, especially in those early years. Like, how do you even communicate through television, a really dumb box, something <laughs> like Bitcoin? So that was a real challenge for years. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so we covered those early years. And, you know, for the most part in 20, Max spoke at the first Bitcoin conference, which happened in Prague. And... That was our first entry in Mar Meat Space. That was in like November of 2011. But we had been talking about Bitcoin for like six or seven months by that point. And um, then we went, met like Bitcoiners in real life. And we were like, oh my God, these people are freaks. Like they're, <laughs> they're all hackers and geeks. And just like, it was like the craziest experience because we had been talking about gold and finance and markets and like, you know, people in suits and stuff like that. And then we're like, we saw all these like crazy hackers and, and it was like the craziest time. Yeah. It was organized by Amir Taki. He was the <laughs> organizer and it was in Prague and um, everyone was like Amir Taki. And, you know, he was trying to convince us that sleep was an artificial social construct and he was not going to ever sleep again. He hadn't slept for three days. Like this oh, is, no. we arrived at the hotel where it was uh, happening and he came up to us like bug eyed. Like, yeah. I haven't slept for three days. And I was like, who are these people? Like, why are what, we here? Where are we? Where are, <laughs> right. And then Rick Fakvinia, he sees us in the hotel. I don't know if you know who that is. He started the pirate party in Sweden. He's early Bitcoiner. And he sees us in the hotel room. And he goes, Max and Stacy, I love your show. Let's all have sex. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I am a swinger. Like he was right, famous. I am a swinger. I was like, oh my God. And I love the Somebody call the bus depot. I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> and then 2012, there was an early, another early Bitcoin conference in London that was pretty well known. And um, that it, maybe um, yeah, 2012, I can't, like I have these images in my head of all these freaks, right? And then there was this one guy who told us like, maybe that was the 2013 one. And he was like, Stacy, like, I have to tell you, I've been working, I've been developing a program for these JP Morgan traders and um, they are trading Bitcoin, but they're not allowed to from work. So I've created this Excel program for them um, and so that automatically buys and sells based on certain momentum and trades and stuff like that. But they hate Max Kaiser because every time he tweets, the price of Bitcoin moves in any direction and they have to get away from their desk and possibly get fired and like shut the program down. Yeah. Because <laughs> Max was able to move markets, yeah. Bitcoin markets back then in 2012. Yeah. Up until 2014, we, we could move like we could move the price uh five percent <laughs> anytime. It, it took a while to figure that out. Like I was yeah. like Hey, Max, that's funny. Like you just tweeted about that and yeah. now Bitcoin went up 20%. And we're like, maybe like, then you started to realize, wait, is it because you tweeted that? Yeah, like but that was, that is also, is kind of a, uh, disorienting because it's, it's hard to take it to, to my conviction was challenged because yeah. I'm like, is this, uh, is this because of the coin or is it because of me? <laughs> Like, if I stop tweeting about this, will it just go to zero? <laughs> it dies. Then my conviction was challenged by this. Yeah, well, and well, then the Mt. Gox thing blew up, you know, and uh, and and the price 
crashed again. Charlie Schramm was arrested. Like Charlie so, Schramm went to jail. So then, like in twenty, yeah, twenty fourteen, when he was arrested and Silk Road got seized and all that stuff, and then I was like, oh my god, Max, do you realize we might get arrested? Yeah, like, that was are serious. We, are like, we in trouble for talking about this? Like we were the only people talking about it all the right. time. I was like, oh my god, like yeah. we're gonna get. We were. We actually didn't go back to the U.S. for quite a while because we were afraid we were going to get arrested. I was like, I, because of talking about we it. We thought we'd like, get Charlie Shrum. <laughs> so we didn't go to the States for years. We That's didn't like, have an exchange or anything, but we were I'm just like, like... I don't want to go anywhere near that. They're going to fucking bust us at the airport. I'm not doing it. And in fact, um, Isabella Kaminska from the FT had said, um, like she wrote a piece or said something along the lines of like, yeah, it's RTs, Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert who are always pushing this. I wonder if they're like, what are the, what, what, they have a role in this. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh shit, like... It, it was like, it was kind of like, so it was a weird area. It's not necessarily, it wouldn't necessarily jump to your mind that this is like digital gold <laughs> and a store of value. It's just like, <laughs> shit, we're all going to get arrested and throw into Guantanamo. It's the opposite of that. This is the, the natural glycerin. I don't know anything about Bitcoin. Right don't arrest me, sir. <laughs> I never heard of that Bitcoin shit. <laughs> it was him. Stacy forced me into it. You know, uh, to kind of continue this, someone in the chat was asking if uh, if you're Satoshi, Max. Care to comment? We're all Satoshi. Thank you very much. We're all Satoshi. <laughs> well said. Well, guys, I uh, I actually have a meeting that I have to jump to, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you all, uh, everybody watching, uh, our whole team at Swan. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much for joining and for being Thanks such for having a, a normie, <laughs> a cool, a cool participant on Bitcoin Twitter and helping out with Swan stuff out, out there. And Max and Stacy, it's just been awesome getting to know you guys uh, so much better, um, in particular over the last year. And you know, Max off and on for the last three years or so. But um, thanks for all you guys do. Thanks for joining us here and, and lending our tiny show uh, such star power from your huge shows. <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know maybe we should all just like get get together in the desert sometime and just like hang out and and party and talk bitcoin one day you know that's i think cool that could idea. be really fun i like that yeah. idea we that's should a totally do awesome it idea. we gotta, we gotta idea. cogitate on that we, really? should, we should think about that anyway i'm gonna sign off you guys please enjoy and uh happy thanksgiving everybody enjoy a vegas read careful out there don't gamble don't shit coin <laughs> <laughs> Bye guys. All right, Corey, get out of here. You, we got something important to do now. This is my favorite part of the show. All right. Let me wait. Where's his window? I'm gonna take him out of, out of there. So this is my favorite part of the show. It's how we usually wrap it up. It's called Swan Force Fridays. Wait, where's Kristen? We lost Kristen. Somebody get Kristen. Where's Kristen? Anyway. I think she thought it was over because the way Corey said goodbye. I I think so too. So what I'm gonna do is waste time by saying absolutely nothing at all. And I'm going to keep wasting time while I message Kristen on Twitter. And in a second, I'll, you'll have my undivided attention. Kristen, come back. Okay. Anyway, I'm here. Swan Force Fridays, what we like to do is we put our guests on the spot. We give them one minute to give us their best Bitcoin pitch. And what I like to ask is that you... Pick someone to pitch. It could be Nuriel Rubini, Jamie Dimon, your grandpa, my grandpa, your uh, old, I don't know, uh, econ teacher in college who said you'd never amount to anything, whoever you want. But you get one minute and you're going to tell us who uh, you're pitching and then we're going to put you on the, on the clock. So, Reed, I'm going to make you go first uh, to show everyone how it's done. Are you yeah. cool? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> I'm pitching six-year-old who keeps getting their toys stolen by their older sibling. Okay, all right. Wow, nice. Nice. I like it. Ready, set, go. Okay, Susie, I understand it's really frustrating that you keep getting your toys stolen by John. John's sort of being a meanie right now. Now, if you don't want your stuff getting stolen by him, I recommend that you just buy... Bitcoin, all right? In fact, don't even need to buy it. Let me let me help you out. I'll send you a little Bitcoin and your brother Johnny will not be able to take it. Never. You know how he takes your, your toys all the time? He won't be able to take your Bitcoin. All you have to do is you just write down a couple of, of words, keep these words under your bed and Johnny will never, ever, ever be able to steal anything that you own I gotta hear as long as you keep it on words under your bed. Done. <laughs> 
Not bad. With 15 seconds to spare. Now, who's next? I'm I've up. got I, one. I'm, oh. Okay, go for it, Stacy. All right, Stacy. Uh, who, who are you going to pitch today? I'm going to pitch Jimi Hendrix. Ooh, I love it. I, I feel like he wouldn't need a pitch, but. Yeah, he does. Because Jimmy, 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 I have to tell you, today would have been your 78th birthday, but you're not here, are you? No. You disappeared quite a while ago when you were 27 years old. You know what you did when you were 27? You dropped some acid. You dropped some LSD. You dropped some other drugs. Had you just hung on, you would have been exposed to the orange pill and beyond purple haze beyond all that fiat shit that you did, you would have been welcome to the Bitcoin community. And perhaps you could have worked with Sean Lennon to create the Orange Pill podcast theme tune. It would have been orange haze instead of purple haze. And you would still be alive today to give us some greatness. You could have been Satoshi because we're all Satoshi. And instead, it's not your 78th birthday today. Purple haze all through my mind. Eh, 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 eh. Orange haze. Orange, orange haze. haze. All through orange my haze. All in my brain. Love it. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Even I'm going to make you go next because uh, I'm, I'm just going to. I don't want to follow Max. I, yeah. I got to go next. <laughs> 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 I didn't want to say it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, uh, let's see, I will pitch gold bugs very broadly. Um, this is going to be the gold bug pitch for Bitcoin. All right. In three, two, one. Hey there, gold bugs. Look, I know I was once one of you, actually. I was a gold bug. I had a safe in my closet with coins, with even some silver bullion. I liked the precious metals because I was skeptical of governments and central banks. And I saw stuff getting more expensive all around in dollar terms. And so I liked scarce assets and I wanted to store my value in them. But then after seeing Bitcoin, I realized it's stronger in just about every way. It's a lot more scarce. There's only 21 million. We know how many there are in the entire universe for all of history, uh, how many there will ever be. So we don't know how much gold is under the floors of the ocean, left in the earth, in our solar system. And even if you can get some of that gold, it's really hard to flee with it. It's really hard to protect it. If you want to actually own something, I know it doesn't seem tangible at first, but you can actually own Bitcoin more than you can own gold. It's more defensible. Buy some. He went over. He went over. <laughs> Let's call it. I'll allow it. I'll allow it. <laughs> so uh, before we move on to uh, Mr. Max Kaiser, there was one comment I wanted to bring up. Okay. I'm okay. There it is. And so castles made of sand fall in the sea eventually. Jimi Hendrix on shitcoins. I would also say on fiat money in general. I would say that the the central bank monopoly that's going to be broken up soon with fiat money and euro dollars and all this other shenanigans going on is one giant sandcastle that's going to get washed away by Bitcoin. All right, I'm done. Max. Yeah. Are you ready? Who are you going to yeah. pitch? I'm going to pitch this to the average person. Love it. All right. In three, two, one. Right. So, Joe, you know how in the past 20, 30 years, every industry in the world has been transformed by computers. All those companies in the world, really, they're not car companies, really. They're tech companies. It's not finance companies. It's a technology company. Every, every industry in the world has been impacted by software and technology, with the one exception. There's only been one exception, and that's been money itself. Money has been transformed for the technology age, the digital age, with something called Bitcoin. Now, initially, it was seemed impossible to create something like Bitcoin because the internet itself, everything is really, really easy to copy. You know, if you're playing a, uh, uh, sending an email, you can do so to thousands of people with a touch of a button. But what these programmers and hackers figured out is how to create something that was impossible to copy and yet you could still 
send it an infinite number of times. I'm not going to go into the particulars of exactly how it works, but the point is that it does. And now it's worth hundreds of billions of dollars because people understand finally that they could have something that they can send over the internet that represents uncounterfeitable form of money and money was ripe to be totally transformed by technology. And that's what happened. So this is a step change in the history of both technology and money. And that's why the price keeps going up. We think the price even at 18,000, you could see it go to three, four, 500,000. So even though it looks high, it's still quite a bargain when you compare it to something like gold. And, um, you know, that's my simple pitch. Wow. And who expected Max Kaiser to deliver that? Like Mr. Rogers. This is Mr. <laughs> Kaiser's neighborhood. That was I, I did it in soothing. 30 seconds or whatever. You went, uh, I went over by 24. Of... I didn't, the, the clock wasn't showing. I Sorry. totally did not keep giving you time. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> somebody in the chat uh, said, a bit more ranty, please. And then someone else answered, Max cannot rant for just one minute. So that's no, the, I'm right. the thing is, I, I orange pill people all the time. And that's what I tell them. Mm -hmm. I, I just say this is a, you know, we've seen it in so many other industries. It caught up to money, and 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 the, the unique what's what's incredible about it is that it's, it's impossible to counterfeit. That's the technology you can't counterfeit it. And but <laughs> it's you you have a digital file you can send an infinite number of times, but it, you can it's impossible to copy. It sounds paradoxical. But he's he's happened. speaking so calmly. Like right. I keep on waiting for him to explain. No, but the, I mean, I was a stockbroker for many years, and I've done hundreds of thousands of pitches on the phone. To, you know, and on the phone. And so, I mean, this is the way I would build a pitch. If I were pitching it to Mr. Jones on the phone, you know, a, a customer, I'd be like, okay, you know, they just- I'll rip the 50 pounds. No, you know, I'm just saying, <laughs> this is how I would sell somebody. I would uh, close somebody. I could close anybody on Bitcoin, except for Peter Schiff, you know, who is just, he was born to lose. You know, he's a born loser. So <laughs> he's never going to get it. But I, I could definitely- uh, you know, it's it's sales sale. The whole sales process is in itself a well well understood funnel, if you will, or process to bring somebody from you know from saying no to saying yes, right? So that's a very structured process. So um, you know that I'm just saying I'm a professional salesman. Have been for many years. Sold financial products for many years. I can sell this to anybody. Um, you know, and I would just use the, the techniques that I've, that I've learned on wall street, how to sell securities on wall street. And it, it doesn't, you know, I mean, I'm on television. That's a different thing. But if I'm talking one-on-one -on, -one on the phone that I would, I would put together a pitch that would, 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 uh, sell somebody the, the goal is to sell somebody, you know, you want to sell somebody, you don't want to, you just got to get that. You got to get the sale. Right. So that's how I would do it. I would just structure it this way. So bring them into you got to get them, you know, there's a whole process to it. I mean, I, I don't think it's that difficult, really. You know, Max, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I think in a year or two, you, you might be out of a job. I think Bitcoin's going to start selling itself. So, yeah, well, you might look into, into, into a backup plan. Just saying. Well, that's why news really, you know, you know, you know, Bitcoin is transitioning to being philosophy. Pure philosophy. That's why all these people like Sailor and, and Breedlove, you know, they've become philosophers. Right. So nobody's actually trying to get anybody to buy Bitcoin anymore. They're trying to it, it, it get people to join the philosophy of Bitcoin, which is what meta. It's a meta concept like money ultimately is is crude. All money is very, very crude. Vulgar. It's it's vulgar on a very basic level. But Bitcoin, it, it algorithmically solves for money. Like it takes actually money out of the equation where we're going. No one's going to need money. I uh, couldn't have put it better myself. Um, I think this might be where we wrap things up, unless anyone has some final words. <laughs> I'm just waiting. I know there has to be a rant coming, and it's going to come as soon as we no, stop. Like, but, you uh, put me on the phone with any random guy, <laughs> and I will close them on Bitcoin. Uh -oh. you know, I've never done... Hook me up with your grandpa in person. It's difficult to close somebody if you can't actually talk to them. Put me on the phone with this, with this individual, and I will close them on Bitcoin. Okay, I'm I'm certain of this. I I have a very high closing ratio. I'm you know, it, there's no doubt down. about it. I can close anybody. You know, for, you get them to, to tell me what what the objection is, and we we knock those re, 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 objections down one by one. The sale begins at no, right? Everyone starts off no. 
Okay, so th this is where we start. And then we the no becomes a yes. First a no, first becomes a maybe. And then the maybe becomes a yes. So you have to get the maybe first. So you got to find where that place, the, the soft the soft parts of their argument, find out where the maybe is, right? <laughs> Everyone's got a maybe in there somewhere. You got to find, you got to tease that out. Once you get them to say maybe, okay, then it's the slam dunk to a yes, because then you just work them down. They're, they're, they're like, they're, you know, the cattle, they're right near the abattoir. They're right near the slaughterhouse there. They made all the twists and turns. They, they went past maybe, and now they're heading to the slaughter right there. You got them. You got them. You got to close right there. Boom. Hit him. Hit him. Like Hit him. Hit him with that clothes. Hit him with the clothes. Do it. Right. I, I feel like this it. could be a fun Set like, me up with series. anybody from six to 90 and I can close them in less than five minutes. I guarantee it. I guarantee it, Brecky. No wonder <laughs> I feel he like did this so well in, in Paris. Right. No wonder he like, loves the French. Like he loves living in France. They say no to everything. No. Yeah. No. C'est impossible. Oui. C'est impossible. It's not interdit. The whole this country needs, is just a challenge. Yeah. This, this needs to be a show yeah. called Journey to Yes with Max Kaiser. Journey to weekly Yes. Weekly series with an open-minded skeptic pre-coiner. And you just you just take them there. Record right. it. We go to the yes. Love it. We start it off, start them off at no. You know, on TV, you know, you're competing with Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner. So I've got to use histrionics. Got to be, you know, using the whole tableau of the television. But you know, one on one over the phone, it's a much more intimate situation. Of you course. get into their head. You know, you probe where that maybe is, and then you you snap the the, the mouse trap shut. All over the yes. <laughs> if, if They're writing a check. They're like, who do I make it out to? If you call it journey to yes, people are going to think it's a a book about the seventies rock band. Yeah. <laughs> journey <laughs> to yes. Journey to yes. Yeah. Ding dong. <laughs> All right, everyone do their best air guitar on three. One, two. Wait, what? What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right up here. Oh, yeah. That's going to be a very good gif material. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I, I learned that Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix used his thumb on, on the handle. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> you got yes, some infrastructure yes, over there. Yes, yes. I just wrote that. <laughs> it's beautiful. Max, you play the ukulele? No. <laughs> oh, now we're talking. Let's go. Oh, sounds like a jam session is in order. Hey, let's do that meme, the cat meme. Yeah, I don't know how it goes. Something, something, number go up. <laughs> oh, we're getting silly on, on this Friday. Very, very silly, and I love it. You know, I had an idea. I've never done um, I've never done the pitches on these shows before. Yeah. Um, I just make other people do them. And pe the people want a Max Kaiser rant, but Max is here. You're kind of tired. And I do impressions. Maybe I should try to do a Max Kaiser rant impression. Yes! Um, Jesus, I am here for this. It'd be disturbing. It might be disturbing. I don't. I'm not really prepared. So I don't know. Uh oh. Let me see. Let me see what I can do here. One second. <laughs> I can't oh. wait. Okay. All right. Let's. Uh... Shit. Now on this, I shouldn't have said that I wanted to do this. Why do I? I don't want to do the this. The pressure's on. Hey, I, I gotta get a cash. Little... Get ready. To no pressure, but pressure. Right. Let the anger through. Anger is an emotion that. Anger uh, is an energy. It's an energy. Is it energy? Energy. Say that again. Energy. Anger is an energy. Anger is, is an energy. You, you gotta. You, you just gotta buy Bitcoin. I don't, I don't know what, what what you're doing. You see these guys like 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 Jamie Dimon and and, and fucking and, and Peter Schiff. Don't listen to them. They're crazy. They want you to lose all your savings. What are you doing? You wanna you you, you work all day. You want you wanna watch your savings evaporate? No, of course not. Buy Bitcoin. Huh. Right, right. Okay, so let me give you some feedback on that. <laughs> So, all right. So, so to build a proper Max Kaiser rant. So first thing you do is you establish um, a protagonist or somebody who is the villain in the story. And this can be done in a fairly straightforward and low key way. The conversational, you know, you want it. The element of surprise is big in a Max Kaiser rant because you don't see it coming. Right. So it's like you start off by talking about Jamie Dimon and something like, yeah, you know, Jamie Dimon, they paid like seven fines last year they were caught 
committing massive fraud. The SEC looks the other way. And they had to pay a billion dollars in fine, right, for gold rigging. And it was discovered that during the time they were paying the fine for the gold rigging, they were actually engaged in more fraudulent trading on the gold exchange. So they paid their fine for the gold rigging by rigging gold. So personally, that made me feel a little bit crazy inside, a little bit angry inside, as it should anybody looking at this and saying, where Jamie Dimon, here's a guy who runs a publicly traded company, and yet no regulator is moving in to curb that kind of, uh, you know, curb his Ill 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 illicit activity. So... Who suffers from something like this? He's undermining the basic economy of the United States. You've got people out there who are now on the streets begging for food, 150 million at or below the poverty line, because guys like Jamie Dimon are not being punished. They're simply operating with reckless, illegal, abandoned, stealing, undermining, corrupting kids in the street dying from opiate overdose because this guy's in the Hamptons. Stealing money with impunity. Right. So you start, so it starts off slow, right? And then you, you let the anger take over. And then the, the <laughs> trick is to be able to keep articulating through the screaming. Because when you're screaming, the, the your head is filled with blood, right? It's hard to keep it's hard to keep the, the words uh you know uh, articulate, right? So that's the key, I would say. It's that crescendo. Cool Gradation, grade it. You got to grade it up because <laughs> you, you want you want people to lean in. What else? It right. Is? So they're like, I think this is SWAT team over. Right. Here. So <laughs> the, the key is, you know, usually, so so you want people to talk quietly so they lean in, just like anyways. Jamie Diamond was. Like, so people are like what, what, what? So now, 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 now they're they're bent over. They're leaning in, right? So they're already uncomfortable. So they, they ask themselves, why am I uncomfortable? Why am I leaning in? Then you start to raise it up. They're like, wait a minute. Can I even lean back now? Or am I stuck in this vortex of anger? I don't even know what I'm going to do. <laughs> then you just slice them up. You cut them with the blade of your words. You let the blood gush out of that jugular. Like, <laughs> like a splash of blood. Just, <laughs> they're like, oh, my God, am I dying? Right. And then at the end, you know, you open the trap door and you say adios, motherfucker. Next time, Brecky, you better take those lessons to heart. I am, am going to work on this because it is an art. And one of the things I actually noticed when what you were just describing for your process is that it's also built on a foundation of knowledge. You know, like, you know, all the dirty laundry of these guys. And so when you're getting angry, it's it's real anger and it's based off fact. And you have your arguments right there. So I got right, to drop in actual facts. Yes. Right. So that because so that's hard to look away from that. It's like seeing somebody like people are rubberneckers on the highway when they see a car accident. The fact is somebody just got their head removed. Right. <laughs> and you can't look away from that. So if you say you know, Jamie Dimon committed fraud and I give you five instances and here's the settlements and here's how he paid for it. Those are facts. If you're not outraged by that. You know, then we, we take it to the next level. Then it's your problem. See, then I, I get angry at you, the, the average person, because you're not angry. How come? I just told you something that should make you angry, and you're not. Is that a failure of you? What There's what levels what, to this? What 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 what, what has happened to you? What what's going on? Oh no! When Max does the outreach face, like where his, <laughs> he has this unique look of like, oh my god, okay, I'm an Episcopalian from from Larchmont, in Westchester County, but I am like the most oppressed person on earth. How can I deal with this? Right. The, the fake outrage is, is a good look. So you need to be I feel outraged. like I would need to physically right. train to do a good Max Kaiser impression. I could probably outrage. do about seven seconds right now. <laughs> yeah, you. you need to do a fake outrage. You have to face. do a fake outrage. It's like, no. What? What? I'm sorry, what? No. What? What? Did. Wait a minute. Did you just. No, Jamie Dimon, right? You know, so you have to be able to like emote with just your face enough anger to scare people, <laughs> right? So they're going to be like, wait a minute, yeah. is this guy fucking carrying a gun? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> he seems awfully angry, but it's got to be all done, you know, with with the uh, facial facial expressions. All right, uh, 
this is my new impression I'm going to work on for the good of Bitcoin as well. I'm going to work on it. I'm going to get this rant perfect. You're so perfect that you're not even going to have to go on RT. I'll just go on for you and you'll be good. And uh, nah. yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, make it work for you. You got to personalize it. Yeah. You know, you, you learn you learn the tools, and then you bring you bring your own you know you know, skill set to it, your own personality. Well, so I'm the Brecky outrage is going to be different ultimately than the Max outrage. I'm definitely these are the stepping these are the building blocks. Angry, you know, but uh, it's like, like Stanislavski I, meets Charles Manson. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get yeah. Mm. Next, next, <laughs> I don't know. I'll think about this one. <laughs> I'm a little uh, disoriented because I took those glasses off. I don't yeah. know for so long, but it's uh, the the orange, the bright orange future is so bright that when you take it off and come back to the real world, it's just ugly and it's hard to adjust. Max sleeps in his. Man, it's yeah. like that movie, They Live. You can't just take the glasses off, man. Once they're on, you That's can't right. unsee right. these things. Exactly. Oh, well, our lights our, are going our out. Our lights are going out. It's time to go. God's <laughs> pulling the plug again. On Max. Fuck you, God. <laughs> I, I'm gonna go fight God now. I can hardly wait to meet God. I'm gonna give him a piece of my mind. He, <laughs> this whole thing is the the mind that. flaw on planet Earth. Let me tell you, the human <laughs> DNA is m riddled with flaws. You know, what, what, how did he even let that out of the lab? What's going on? Oh you know, God. it's not right. We're gonna okay. Now we get struck by lightning <laughs> and we're dead. That will be a, a great ending to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there he goes. He's gone. Right. But hey, I can close anyone, Brecky. You set him up. You I'm, set him up. You set him up. I knock him down. I'll give you a customer every five minutes. I'm gonna send my gramps that video first of all, and then I might uh, I might take you up on that phone. I call. used to do sales on a. I was hooked up to a computer with a with a over over a seer, and you had to make a sale every twenty minutes, or you were fired. This was back when I was uh, in 20 years old, 19, 20 years old. So was, you were selling vitamins and uh, auto club insurance. <laughs> At the same and, time. Um, so you're on the phone and you've got to, you've got to make a sale every, tw every 20 minutes. If you don't make a sale, you go on probation. And then if you don't make a sale within 40 minutes, then you're fired. So um, you had these pods of six people on phones and then you had somebody at the, and they're listening to every single call. It's called a company called Campaign Communications Institute, CCI. It was on West 57th Street in New York. This was in late 70s, early 80s. If they're still around, we should get them calling people up for Swan. That's not a bad yeah. idea. I don't think. Well, it's not, <laughs> they're not around. It's, it's, yeah, this, I, I think it became illegal to do that. It's that, not that cost efficient to, to no. use this type of hired labor. You know, you have automatic callers now and all this stuff. You don't need humans to make all these calls. Yeah. But um, so, well, you know, it's like. Just talking to I've made like three hundred thousand sales pitches. Okay, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna sell you on closing this show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sold, Max. There's more pumpkin pie in the fridge. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm a closer. Bang. You did it. <laughs> All right, to our guests, thank you for joining us. To Stephen Cole, our other guests, thank you for joining us. To Always our, a pleasure. That's already goodbye. We don't love you. Oh, to our, 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 our viewers, our listeners, we love you very much. We'll see you next week for Swan Lounge on Tuesday. And of course, Swan's, no, Swan Lounge on Friday, Swan Signal on Tuesday. And to close out, I will play our amazing New York video in case you haven't gotten it through your heads that we're open in New York because Swan is open in New York. Goodbye, everyone. We'll see you next week. Oh, no, that's the wrong video. Don't play that. See ya. Wrong video. In a world filled with uncertainty, Bitcoin gives us hope. And if we work together, we can bring about a bright orange future just a little bit sooner. With low fee automatic buys, daily, weekly, or monthly, free automatic withdrawals, and world-class Bitcoin education, we've made it safe and easy to accumulate Bitcoin because you have your life to live. So go on and live it. All over the US, people are choosing SWAN to achieve their Bitcoin goals. But in the financial capital of the world, the options for building your Bitcoin future are limited. Today, we are proud to announce that SWAN Bitcoin is now open for business in all 50 states 
including the great state of New York. Sign up at swanbitcoin.com slash New York and get $10 of free Bitcoin when you become a member. Together, we are helping to build that bright orange future from sea to shining sea. We are advocates. We are educators. We are Bitcoin. Yes.